Hello, and welcome to Grand Dukes of the West. Supplemental Episode 2, Jana vs. Jana. Today we're going to take another break from the narrative and travel to Brittany to explore the War of the Two Janas, also known as the War of Breton Succession. When I was writing episode 14, I kept thinking about how much an overview of the War of Breton Succession would be useful, but also didn't want to dedicate a huge chunk of the episode to it. Therefore, today's episode is going to flesh out the context of the later conflict between Olivia de Clisson and John of Montfort. Before we get started, I'd like to shout out Friend of the Show Past Podcast, which also has an episode on the War of Breton Succession coming out soon. The episode has not been released as of time of recording, but I'm still going to recommend that you check it out, as Past is a great show. So without further ado, let's dive into the War of the Two Genres. If you listen to the first supplemental episode on the dampier Aven blood feud, you'll probably notice a few similarities between the conflicts, starting with half-siblings not getting along. It is a common trope for a reason. Our story begins with an aging Duke John III of Brittany. As Duke John had no children of his own, the question on everyone's mind was who was going to be the next Duke of Brittany. And, as this episode is on the War of the Breton Succession, I'm sure by now you figured out that there were multiple options. The first of these was Jeanne of Pontiev, a niece of Duke John III of Brittany, and the first of our two Jeannes. Jeanne was the daughter of John's younger brother, Guy of Pontiev, and was married to Charles of Blois. The second candidate was John of Montfort, a younger half-brother of John III, and son of the previous duke. John of Montfort was married to Jeanne of Flanders, the second of our two Jeannes, and, by the way, the sister of Count Louis of Nevers, and thus the aunt of Count Louis of Mala. So, who had the better claim? Well, it's not entirely clear, hence the war. Jeanne of Pontiev argued that as her father would have been John's uncontested heir if he was still alive, and she was her father's heir, that she should inherit his claim to Brittany. John of Montfort argued that he was more closely related to John III, and that he was a man. Now the argument of gender is an interesting one in the context of this war, which, after all, is named after two women. Without giving too much away, at some point in the conflict, both Charles of Blois and John of Montfort will be imprisoned, and each Jana will have their turn leading their faction. More immediately relevant, it wasn't entirely clear if gender mattered for the inheritance of Brittany, and there were valid arguments both ways. On Pontiev's side, she argued that in the past, Brittany had been passed to women and had been inherited through a female line. Montfort argued that those cases happened before Brittany became a peerage of France, and as Brittany was now a peerage of France, French rules of inheritance, i.e. Salic law, remember that one, should apply. Duke John III did not do much to clear the air. Throughout most of his life, he held a hatred for his father's second wife and her family, and so took every opportunity to push them away. When his full brother Guy died, he intended to disinherit John of Montfort, but also seemed doubtful about Jeanne of Pontiev's ability to rule Brittany, and so proposed selling the right to inherit Brittany to King Philip VI. At this point, Brittany was still an independent duchy, and the nobles of Brittany valued that independence and so threatened rebellion. John III gave in and spent the next few years trying to strengthen Pontiev's position. One way he did that was by marrying her to Charles of Blois. Charles was closely connected to the Valois dynasty, being a nephew of Philip VI, and was a capable commander and administrator in his own right. Duke John spent the next few years strengthening Jeanne and Charles's positions in Brittany by granting them lands and facilitating alliances. Charles was designated as Duke John's official heir, and that probably would have been the end of things if not for the Duke himself. About a year before his death, for some reason Duke John decided to reconcile with John of Montfort, and, going even further, made a new will that named Montfort as his heir. However, Jeanne of Pontiev and Charles of Blois were still broadly liked in the duchy, while John of Montfort had spent more or less the past three decades as an outsider. So now, while John of Montfort was technically the heir, the water was muddied enough that careful plans would have to be made to balance the parties in Brittany and compensate Jeanne and Charles. But Duke John did not feel like making those plans, and the next year, as he was dying, when asked about the succession, he reportedly said, quote, for God's sake, leave me alone, and do not trouble my spirit with such things. After the duke's death, the great nobles and clerics of Brittany met to choose the next duke, and chose Charles of Blois. 
but John of Montfort would not take this lying down. He gathered a force of soldiers and invaded Brittany. Montfort headed first to Nantes, Brittany's most important city, and quickly took it. Parties soon formed around the two candidates for duke. The Loire was supported primarily by the magnates of Brittany and the Breton church, while Montfort primarily held sway with the lower nobility and the towns. As the claimants were now dug in, the highest court of France, the Paris Parlement, would have to decide the issue. By now, Montfort controlled most, but not all, of the peninsula, and Charles of Blois had been asking his uncle the king for aid for some time. Philip may have been content to leave Brittany to Montfort, but this was 1341, and the Hundred Years' War was ongoing. Rumors had reached the king that Montfort was planning on paying homage to Edward III, and was going to recognize his claim to be king of France. Brittany's strategic position between England and Guienne made it extremely important for both sides to hold. At this point in history, open sea crossings were almost unheard of in Europe. Ships generally moved along the coast and only during the day. Therefore, a ship moving from Bordeaux to England would sail up the Atlantic coast and around Brittany before crossing the English Channel. If the French had a firm grasp on the peninsula, a fleet could be stationed there which could essentially sever that sea route. Taxes, wine, and military reinforcements would all be forced to travel overland through large swaths of hostile territory. King Philip summoned John of Montfort to Paris and began to grill him on his communications with the English. While Montfort had been in talks with the English, he was not willing to commit to joining the war against France if he didn't have to. But Philip's hostile reception convinced John that he did in fact have to join with the English. Montfort fled from Paris and agreed to ally with Edward. Philip responded by officially deciding the inheritance of Brittany in favor of Jean of Pontiev and Charles of Blois, and furthermore seized Montfort's estates outside of Brittany. All of a sudden, the War of Breton Succession had become a theater of the Hundred Years' War. Both the English and French made efforts to support their chosen candidates for Duke of Brittany, but neither made the peninsula the main theater of focus. The French force was led by Philip's son John, Duke of Normandy and future not-so-good King of France. The tide now began to turn against John of Montfort. The Duke of Normandy and Charles of Blois teamed up to besiege the city of Nantes. As the siege continued, the people of Nantes grew tired of supporting Montfort. They were not devout Montfortist partisans, but rather supported him because he got to their city before Blois did. Eventually, Nantes pushed Montfort out, and he agreed to surrender to the Duke of Normandy. In many cases, this would mark the end of the Civil War. But the capture of Montfort did not mark the end of the Montfortist cause. Rather, leadership was taken up by Jeanne of Flanders. I do want to note that Jeanne of Flanders did not simply arise out of nowhere, but instead held a leadership role in her husband's operation from the beginning. So with her husband in French custody, Jeanne was forced to take charge. If she didn't act quickly and decisively, the Montfortist cause would evaporate. She ordered a strategic retreat towards the western end of Brittany to regroup, and the blois pontiev faction now held most of the duchy. To see how the next phase of the war plays out, we now have to look at Brittany itself. The duchy could be roughly divided into eastern and western halves. The western half was Breton Brittany. It was hilly, heavily forested, and quite inhospitable. The locals spoke Breton, a Gaelic language, and there was only one significant town at the time, Vaughan. Meanwhile, the eastern half of Brittany was Gallo-Brittany. Here, French was more widely spoken, and the land resembled the neighboring territories of Maine, Anjou, and Poitou more than the rugged west. The eastern half of Brittany was thus not only more culturally tied to France, but the relatively flat land and geographic position made it much easier to reach from France. Meanwhile, the western end of the peninsula was much harder for the French to project their military force onto. But this is not to say that Montfort was popular in the West. In fact, the Pontiev faction generally had more support on that side of the peninsula. However, the geography of the West combined with the hostility of the French and the support of the English to suggest it to Jeanne of Flanders. The next few months saw the French blois Pontiev faction advancing, while the Montfortists were struggling to hold on to what they still had. By now, the Montfortists and the English had signed a treaty of alliance, but aid was slow to come. Things were complicated by the fact that England and France were currently in a truce, and that truce also applied to England's allies in the Low Countries. While Edward III was keen on invading Brittany to save the Montfortists and expand English influence, his allies in Flanders and Brabant were much less keen on facing a potential French retaliatory strike. English soldiers had been fighting for the Montfortists this whole time, 
but that was an expeditionary force led by an enterprising knight rather than a royal army. Now in August 1342, Jeanne of Flanders had been forced out of her base of operations at Ennebol and fled further west to Brest. Now she was trapped by the French army on land and the French fleet on the sea. But as all seemed lost, the tide began to turn. The Earl of Northampton managed to run the French blockade and landed in Brest in mid-August with a much-needed army. Northampton began a new campaign against the Pontiev forces and was joined a few months later by Edward III himself with another army. Edward led the English to Vaughan and placed it under siege. Vaughan had a rough go of it in 1342. It started the year held by the Montfortists, and then it was taken by Charles of Blois. Blois held it for a few months, but it was then taken back by the Montfortists, who in turn lost it to supporters of the Pontiev Blois cause. So Edward's siege of Vaughan was the fourth one of the year. Edward took Vaughan without too much effort and captured the city's governor, Olivia de Clisson. Due to the perceived ease of Edward's siege and de Clisson's low ransom for a noble of his standing, suspicion arose that Olivia de Clisson betrayed the city to the English. No proof of this accusation was ever brought to light, but King Philip believed it. Upon de Clisson's return to France, Philip lured him to Paris and executed him. This move served to alienate many nobles, especially the de Clisson clan. We're mostly familiar with Olivia de Clisson's son, also named Olivia de Clisson. But at this point, the younger Olivier was still a child, and so the defection from Blois to Montfort was led by Jeanne de Clisson, the elder Olivier's widow and younger Olivier's mother, sometimes also known as Jeanne de Belleville. Jeanne de Clisson is an incredibly interesting figure, and not only because she now marks the third Jeanne in our War of the Two Jeannes. The widow de Clisson did not take the execution of her husband lying down, and instead raised a force of her own and became a pirate queen. She commanded a collection of ships known as the Black Fleet, and her flagship was named My Revenge. The Black Fleet definitely had an effect on the course of the war, and was a thorn in the side of the Pontiev Blois faction, but how much, I'm not sure. Eventually, the French navy was able to destroy the Black Fleet, and Jeanne and Olivier were rescued by the English and lived in England for the next few years. But by the time that the elder Olivier de Clisson was executed, a new truce was agreed to. The truce of Malatois marked a break in the fighting between the French and English, but Charles of Blois argued that his fight was separate from the king's and kept working to expel the English and Montfortists from his peninsula. After the truce was agreed to, Jeanne of Flanders accompanied Edward back to England. Once in England, Jeanne was marginalized by Edward. The king claimed that she went mad and thus confined her, but it is unclear whether she was actually suffering from a serious mental illness or if Edward just used that as an excuse to increase his hold over the Montfortist camp. Either way, the lands that the Montfortists and by extension the English controlled were the western and southern coasts of the peninsula. The heart of the English position was now Brest in the west, and this marked the beginning of the port town's rise to prominence. As Charles of Blois rejected the truce, fighting continued in Brittany, but at a smaller scale. France and England were no longer fighting directly, but Blois' forces continued to try and push the Montfortists and English out into the sea. And at this point, it really was the English rather than the Montfortists. Edward had pushed Jeanne of Flanders to the sidelines, while Jean of Montfort himself was in prison in Paris. Eventually, he was released according to the terms of the truce, but he was ordered to remain in his lands in France rather than return to Brittany. John remained in France, and as Jonathan Sumption put it, quote, the fact that John was free but declined to help the Bretons who were fighting in his name was far more demoralizing than his imprisonment had ever been. At this point, many of the Breton Montfortists began to defect to Charles of Blois. The Montfortist cause began to collapse and over the course of the truce, Charles of Blois was able to take almost the whole peninsula. He wasn't able to completely expel the English, and they still held a handful of fortified coastal towns and castles, most notably Brest. The English did not want to yield Brittany to Blois, but at this point in the conflict, they were exhausted and beginning to focus their efforts elsewhere. The truce of Malatois was in effect, and as long as they could hold their coastal fortresses, they didn't want to reignite the fighting if it wasn't necessary. But by now, the truce would not last much longer. In March 1345, John of Montfort escaped his home imprisonment and set sail for England. By now his party had all but disappeared, and even among the remaining Montfortists, he was a figurehead more than a leader. But now the English at least were in possession of that figurehead. Later that year, Edward III repudiated the truce and began the Cressy Campaign. 
While the chevauchée through Normandy, Battle of Cressy, and seizure of Calais did not directly involve Brittany, the campaign did change the balance of power in the wider war so drastically that it had a significant indirect effect on the duchy. The Cressy campaign was actually initially planned to begin in Brittany, and in late 1345, John of Montfort was back in the peninsula, laying the groundwork for the English advance. Montfort and the English began a sweep through central Brittany, which initially was a great success. The French saw Charles of Blois' position begin to weaken, and so sent over a contingent of their own. The stage was set for a dramatic final confrontation between John of Montfort and Charles of Blois at the head of English and French armies, but much to the disappointment of lovers of drama and spectacle, things did not play out that way. John of Montfort was in the midst of a siege of the city of Compere in the southwest of the peninsula when Charles of Blois arrived and drove Montfort and his forces away. There was no great battle, but rather a messy retreat, and John of Montfort caught a chill and died about a month later. The Montfort claim to Brittany passed to John of Montfort's five-year-old son, also called John of Montfort. This, by the way, is the same John of Montfort that Charles VI wanted to teach a lesson to in the last episode. However, as John of Montfort Jr. was so young, he was even more of a figurehead than his father was. The English commander, who was serving alongside the elder John of Montfort, continued his campaign to prepare for Edward's arrival. Unfortunately for the English, Edward planned to land on the northern coast of Brittany, but this region was where Jeanne of Pontiev's support was strongest. In fact, much of it was Pontiev. The rest of the region was controlled by the Viscounts of Rohan, who were Jeanne of Pontiev's strongest supporters and tended to hate the English more than anyone else in the duchy. So, in the end, the English couldn't secure a good landing spot in Brittany, and Edward landed in Normandy. The most important development for Brittany after Cressy was simply now that Edward III had a lot of room to maneuver, while Philip VI had very little. Although the leader of the Montfort faction was now a child, the elder John of Montfort was never much of an inspiring leader or able commander, and the War of Breton's succession continued just fine without him. The Montfortist faction began to grow again, and without a French army supporting Charles of Blois, the Montfortists and English now had the initiative. Throughout 1347, the Montfortists expanded their holdings at Blois' expense, and in June, they managed to capture the Duke. The capture of Charles of Blois meant that it was now Jeanne of Pontiev's turn to take charge of her faction, as Jeanne of Flanders did five years earlier. While the capture of Charles of Blois was a major setback to the Blois-Pontiev party, it did not mark its collapse. The English simply did not have enough men in Brittany to take the peninsula, and the Pontiev faction was unable to kick them out. As long as the English held their forts on the coast, they could keep the sea lane between England and Aquitaine open, and if they could do that, there wasn't much need to encroach further. Furthermore, the French government had lost the ability and the interest to intervene in the duchy. The situation in Brittany stayed this way for several years, so rather than going through all the minor events and battles, I'll quote Jonathan Sumption once more. Quote, With all the principal participants removed from the scene, the Breton Civil War became more than ever a formless contest between small bands and local enmities and ambitions, of coups and surprises, banditry, intensifying desolation and poverty, and strategic realities essentially unchanged for years. In late 1352, Jeanne of Pontiev figured that the King of France, now John the Good, was unable to secure her husband's release and so decided to cultivate a détente with the English. The next year, an agreement was reached that completely reshuffled the political situation in Brittany. Charles of Blois was released from his imprisonment in England and was recognized by Edward III as Duke of Brittany, in exchange for a large ransom and a guarantee of Breton neutrality. Furthermore, one of Charles' sons would be married to one of Edward's daughters, and the two agreed to a defensive pact in case John decided to invade Brittany when he heard of the deal. John of Montfort now lost English support, but was compensated with the return of lands formerly held by his family, which had been seized by the Blois-Pontiev faction, as well as a pension paid for by the Duke. However, the peace between Brittany and England would not last long, and soon the situation was right back where it had been for the past few years, albeit with Charles of Blois in his duchy once more. The next big shakeup to the conflict was Poitiers, but this was not the shakeup that Cressy was. Sure, France was in an arguably worse position after this battle, but Brittany had been receiving little French support over the past decade anyway. A few years later, Charles's rival, the now in his 20s John of Montfort, joined him in the duchy. John brought with him Olivia de Clisson, 
which is interesting, both because the two became bitter enemies in later years and because now two future constables of France were cutting their teeth in Brittany, as Bertrand du Guesclin was fighting for Charles of Blois and had been for a few years now. John of Montfort's return to Brittany marks the beginning of the end of the War of Breton succession. The two ducal claimants each controlled about half of the peninsula, and a few times a peace had almost been reached but ended up falling through. In 1364, John of Montfort was besieging the town of Ure, and Charles of Blois brought an army of his own to relieve the siege. In the battle that followed, Charles of Blois was killed. News of the duke's death caused his faction to fall apart. Maybe Jean of Pontiev wasn't as strong of a leader as Jean of Flanders, or maybe by now everyone was just tired of fighting. But the blois pontiev children did not take up their late father's cause, as John of Montfort had done. The fighting didn't end immediately after Blois' death, and some skirmishing and much politicking was still needed to settle things. But most everyone was now willing to accept John of Montfort as duke. A treaty between John of Montfort and the French king, now Charles V, was signed in 1365, where John acknowledged Charles as king of France, and Charles acknowledged John as duke of Brittany. The treaty also made sure to guarantee Jeanne of Pontiev's personal territories of Pontiev, and made it so that if John's line died out, succession to Brittany would go to Jeanne's descendants. This treaty caused some tensions between Duke John and his English backers, but as they still held their coastal fortresses, they really didn't care too much about who ruled the rest of the peninsula. Furthermore, regardless of who John acknowledged as King of France, he was not going to be able to kick the English out of their fortresses, and it seemed like John still had plans to play the English and French off each other. So now let's have a little epilogue to catch Brittany up to where it was in episode 14. John of Montfort continued to cultivate English support over the next few years, much to the dismay of the French. Tensions continued to rise, and the 1370s saw conflict between France and Brittany boil over. Duke John returned to his English alliance, but was soon driven out of his duchy by the French, led by his now ex-companion-in-arms, Olivia de Clisson. John of Montfort returned to his duchy with an English army, and Brittany was once again a major front in the Hundred Years' War. As it was the 1370s, the French were on the advance. Before too long, they controlled just about all of the duchy, save for the area around Brest, which was still held by the English. But Charles V went too far when he announced his plan to annex the duchy into the royal domain. This proclamation galvanized the independent Breton nobility against him. This movement was in fact led by Jeanne of Pontiev, which goes to show just how much the Breton nobility valued their independence. Or, possibly, this move was led by more directly self-serving desires, as John of Montfort was currently childless, meaning that her sons stood to inherit the duchy at the moment. The planned annexation of the duchy came to nothing but headaches, and the deaths of Charles V and Bertrand du Guesclin led the new leaders of France to seek peace with John of Montfort. The resulting treaty cleaved the duke from the English, and thus thoroughly alienated Montfort's best allies. But the next few years were fairly good for Brittany. John of Montfort cultivated an alliance with the Dukes of Berry and Burgundy, and so, for the first time in his life, he had powerful figures advocating for him at the French court. But there was also a thoroughly anti-Montfortist voice at court, Olivia de Clisson. The new constable of France was still on bad terms with his former comrade-in-arms, and so allied himself with the remains of the blois pontiev faction. And, with the death of Jeanne of Pontiev in 1384, Olivia de Clisson became its de facto head. The conflicts of the War of Breton Succession were now taken up by John of Montfort and Olivia de Clisson, but it really was a new conflict now, one driven by personality and ambition within France rather than one for the ducal crown. We saw in episode 14 how their rivalry drove French policy during the personal rule of Charles VI, and how it indirectly brought about his madness. So next time, we'll see how Olivia de Clisson and John of Montfort deal with the madness of Charles VI and the new order of things in France as Philip the Bold takes over the kingdom once again. Now on to some patron questions from the last episode. First, we go straight from one Breton constable to another during the reign of Charles V. Given the shaky nature of French control over the duchy, was this for strategic reasons? Was Charles V trying to buy the loyalty of the Bretons through the appointment of de Clisson, or was he just coincidentally the best man in the army for the job who had the right blood? So, from my understanding, it's mostly a coincidence that both constables were Bretons, 
I think it was due to there being such a large number of Breton nobles in the French officer corps, since, as we saw, the War of Breton Succession alienated many of those Breton nobles from the Montfort Duke of Brittany. Therefore, they sought employment in royal service rather than ducal service. We'll see that the next constable, Philip of Artois, was not a Breton. Next. You mentioned briefly that the Cardinal of Laon was poisoned. Is there a suspect here, or is it just something that the Chronicles note with a brief shrug that never called for much investigation? So, uh, the uncles were thought to be behind the murder, but I don't think any investigation ever came of it, and I haven't seen any evidence or testimony linking them to it. Still, if someone were to tell me that it was on the orders of Philip the Bold or John of Berry, I definitely wouldn't be surprised, and it seems that contemporaries also thought that. And finally, you mentioned that the Marmosets wanted to rein in the budget. Given that most of them were prominent during the reign of Charles V, did they want to do so then? If not, was this less about balancing the books and more about curtailing the uncles? From my understanding, the desire to reduce spending actually goes back to Charles V. On his deathbed, he appealed to his son for lower taxes. Back in episode 9, I mentioned both an initial reduction in taxes and the Mayotte revolts triggered by the return of many of the taxes. I think the reason that during Charles V's reign there wasn't the same drive to reduce taxes was due to the greater intensity of the fighting taking place. Furthermore, under the uncle's regime, there was a noticeable increase in grift. Therefore, a greater proportion of the taxes were being misappropriated, so a reduction of taxes would theoretically not interfere with the operations of government if only grift was reduced. Finally, the longer that the high and honestly unevenly enforced taxes were in place, the more politically and economically damaging they were. So, while there was a definite need to reduce taxation in 1380, it only got worse by 1388. And thanks to my patrons, especially Elliot, who upgraded his membership from Lord to Count, and so is now the Graf von Gravenstein. And also to Christine, Comte de Chenonceau, Anthony, Comte de chateauneuf en and to my Knights of the Duchy. If you want to join them, you can at patreon.com slash valoisburgundy. If you like the show, I would really appreciate it if you would rate and review it on Apple Podcasts or your platform of choice, and tell your friends about it. If you want to keep up with the show, you can follow me at twitter.com slash valoisburgundy, or find Grand Dukes of the West on Facebook, or on Mastodon at mas.to slash at valoisburgundy. You can also email me at granddukesofthewest at gmail.com, and check out the podcast website for maps, images, and more at granddukesofthewest.com.